Romans. And you're looking at chapter 5 here. On that note of uh, praying for our leaders, I think it was Paul and Timothy who wrote that we were pray for all those authority that we might live a quiet and peaceable life. Mm -hmm. yeah. We certainly should stand for what is right and call sin for what it is, but uh, <coughs> there see the scriptures calling us to go protest at Washington, D.C. Right. We are to live as a peaceable people. <laughs> well, let's go to Romans chapter 5. Look at verses 11 and 12 today, Lord Lord. If you recall from the last lesson, we saw how that because we are justified, we'll be saved from wrath. We saw that, how, that we've been reconciled to God through Christ, and because of this, He will most certainly save us and so much more. And He continues on that same thought here in verse 11, and He says, Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, with whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Amen. When he begins, verse 11, with not, and not only so, not only do we have all these blessings from the previous verses, really going all the way back to verse 5, but you know, not only do we glory in tribulation, as it says in verse 3, but he says, but also we joy in God. Amen. That is that joy here is normally translated as glory or sometimes as boast or rejoice. It's the same as glory and tribulation in verse 3. That we are to glory in God or boast in God or rejoice in God if you will. That God should be the source of all of our joy, all of our glory and all of our boasting. Mm -hmm. and when we can boast in a good sense <clears throat> well, there is boasting in ourselves and that's certainly not scriptural but to boast in God or to glory in God that is what we are called to do Amen. we are not to bring glory to ourselves but we are to bring glory to God by both our words and our deeds but he says not and not only so but we glory in God through our Lord Jesus Christ we who it is in the person of God, all that he has done for us that we should glory in. Mm -hmm. or that we should joy in, as it says here. You know, in his righteousness, his holiness, we can find joy in those things. Just that he is God, he is our God, we can find joy in that. And all that he has done for us. If you ever really just stop and really study and meditate upon one attribute of God will be a almost overwhelming thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I've many times looked at him from the aspect of creator and all he goes in that and all that he accomplished in that is really mind boggling when you think about it. Mm -hmm. And even as someone who has an engineering background and has taken physics in college, it's still beyond man's Little of comprehension. The man tries to come up with theories and explanations and all these different ideas, but yet just creation alone is past the understanding of the carnal mind. Amen. Well, there, we have much that we can joy in God through. We have much that we can give glory to Him for. That's why not only just that he has saved us and justified us and reconciled us, but just that he is God and all that goes with it, him being God who he is is enough to, that we should glory in him. Mm -hmm. You know, in another place, Paul writes, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That Really, the beginning of the cross is where our, all our glory, or all our boasting, if you want to say it that way, all our joy should start from. And then it goes on, really out to God Himself and who He is, and all that goes along with that He has done for us. Notice here in our text, He says, "Through our Lord Jesus Christ." 
truly only through the person of Christ that we can rightly give glory to God. Amen. If we are not in Christ, then we can't give him the glory in the same type of way. And it's through our Lord Jesus Christ that we can know God and know more about God and who he is. We can know about God through nature, but only to a certain extent. The heavens declare his glory, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So Amen. Saying. So yes, man can look out and know that there is a God just by nature. Of course, we know that man denies God in that way, but even creation itself cries out that there is a God. So through the law of Moses, we can know about God, but still only to a certain extent. In the law, we see his hatred for sin, his punishment upon sin. You know, death is required because of sin. You know, that only blood can atone for sin. Amen. But we still don't see the fullness of God in the law. Yet in the person of Christ, it's said in Colossians 2, 19, and dwelt, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then in John 1, 14, when he's called the Word, it says that he is full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. It is through the person of Christ that we can really fully know God and who he is. I'm reminded of another place, I forget which apostles, that asked Christ to show us the Father. And he said, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. It's through Christ that we can fully understand God and rightly give him the glory that he deserves. Now, if you're not in Christ, you're still going to bring him glory, but in a different sense. Right. When he has victory over sin and all of those who are the servant of sin, he'll get the glory out of that. But it won't be the same type of glory as we can give him as the servants of God. Amen. Even we see over in Romans chapter 9, we see another way he gets the glory. I'm going to turn there, Romans 9, 17. I think one of Brother Larry's favorite passages. Referring back to the Exodus in the Old, the Old Testament, it says, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Amen. We know Pharaoh was a wicked ruler, and he persecuted God's people and didn't <coughs> want to let them even go personally didn't want to let them go worship God but he didn't want to let them go at all and even after he said he would and then he pursued them and you might say well how does God get glory out of that well, Pharaoh and his empire was a mighty empire at the time and yet just one fell swoop he wiped them all out in the Red Sea mm -hmm. God, in that he showed his great power over even a ruler like Pharaoh. He got against the glory even out of wicked men. Mm -hmm. So we are to give him glory in a different sense. We are to we praise him and tell of his greatness and say, look at God, all he is and all he has done. If the wicked, they will give God the glory, but it will be in their defeats. Then the others will be able to look and say, yes, God is even greater than that one. I guess God truly hates sin because of what he has done here. We see that in Sodom and Gomorrah. How he rained fire and brimstone something down upon them, destroyed them and the cities around about them, the scripture says. Mm -hmm. And we sure God got the glory out of that as well. And that he showed his great hatred for sin. Oh, we should, God and all that he is through the person of Christ should be the source of all our joy, all our glory, and all our boastings. Amen. Let's go back to our text here in Romans, Romans 5, 11, and he says that not only so, but we also glory or joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Mm -hmm. By by whom it is referring back to Christ. In him we have received this atonement. And notice it says that we now have it. Not that it 
is a future thing that we'll receive, but it says even presently we have received this atonement. Mm -hmm. And it's by the person of Christ that we have received it. I thought it was, it's interesting to note that this is the only time atonement is used in the New Testament versus 69 times in the Old Testament. The word atonement means to purge or to cover. Mm -hmm. That is what the law sought to do through the sacrifices and offerings was to cover sins for a season. Mm -hmm. They came, they made that yearly sacrifice to cover their sins until the next time they came around. When they came and they made the offerings, it, it purged them from sin in a, a temporary sense. But the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins forever, as Hebrew says. Yet Christ, when he came, he made a permanent covering for sin. He made he purged us completely from sin. His atonement was a perfect atonement. Hebrews 9, I'm going to turn there and read that for us. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. Well, he was, Paul had been telling us how the old temple was a figure, and the law and the sacrifices were all a figure of the heavenly, you know, perfect sacrifice that would come. In verse 11 it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, or excuse me, by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once in the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. He was the Old Testament priests, they had to continually stand there and give not only offerings for their own selves, but also for the people of Israel. Enter in the holies of holies and spread that blood on the mercy seat. But yet Christ, it says he entered in once into that holy place. Mm -hmm. That is the holiest of holies in heaven, the mercy seat, which is before God. You know, I don't know what it looks like in heaven, but I know that the tabernacle and the temple were supposed to be a, a figure of the heavenly temple. Amen. But it says that Christ entered into that place once and he attained eternal redemption for us. That Christ, he went there and he applied that atonement, that covering for sin for us. He only had to do it one time. Amen. Contrary to what the Catholics teach that he has to be offered over and over again. Mm -hmm. For what they call the Eucharist, or what, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper, they, they think he's literally offered again and again and again. Mm -hmm. No, Christ was offered once for sin. You're right. And he one time entered into the holiest of all and made atonement for our sins there. And he says he, he didn't just make it possible, but he obtained it for us. Amen. Yeah. He obtained that eternal redemption for us. He made that perfect atonement for us, that our sins are covered forevermore. That as, as the psalmist wrote, that they were removed as far as the east is from the west. Amen. And they're cast into the sea, never be brought up again. <laughs> He has made not only a covering for sin, but also a purging from sin. Amen. First John 1 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If he covers our sins, then he purges us from sin. That's the perfect atonement. Amen. Well, for what it's worth, this the Greek word here, here is used in other places in the scripture in the New Testament three other times and it's translated as reconciled or reconciliation and even in the Hebrew it's that word is sometimes translated reconciliation as well so, so I think the implication is that when atonement is made we are reconciled to God Amen and we saw in verse 10 that through Christ and through his death we are reconciled to God once again which we'll see in verse 12 we once had 
a perfect relationship with God. That's why we can be reconciled back to Him because we were once in agreement, if you will, with Him, and then sin separated us. And through the person of Christ, we were brought back into that agreeable state again. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to verse 12 here. He says, Wherefore? So now we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to see why man is called ungodly, why man is a sinner in the sight of God, why man is the enemy of God. He says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. This is, of course, by Adam in the garden. We don't have to turn there, but Genesis 3, the first 19 verses record that where the serpent beguiled Eve and she ate of the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yes, ladies, you have some suffering due because of that, but ultimately there's the fault was found upon Adam, though, wasn't it? Right. He was the one that was held responsible for the sin. And I think partly that is because man to be the head, and also because he was first given to man even before Eve was created. Mm -hmm. So Adam fell there in the garden, and thus we all fell, and thus by him sin entered into the world. Mm -hmm. You can be sure before him there wasn't sin, there wasn't some other race of humans that were living separately. There wasn't some aliens out there living somewhere, but right. the creation was perfect and without sin. Amen. That's almost past our understanding and living in this sin-cursed world that we live in. There was not even the tiniest drop of sin there. There was no death. There was no suffering. There was no pain. There was perfect harmony in all of creation. Even the lions... You know, they ate straw as the lamb did. The scripture says that one day that's going to be restored again. You know, I don't. I sometimes start to think of how beautiful a place this world was before the sin corrupted it. Mm -hmm. well, and physically speaking, I don't know how it all worked out, how it was, how everything was to go, but I just know it was without. Even the slightest bit of sin. There was no Amen. Way. Yeah. We didn't have predators and prey seeking one another. We didn't have headaches and toothaches and eating these glasses and all these other things. You know, if it hadn't been for sin, then for women, the childbearing would have been without pain. Right. For us men, we would have went out and worked still, but it would have not been such a burden upon the flesh. Right. In fact, it was that it was part of the curse that, was, that by the sweat of our brow we would work all the day long. Mm -hmm. But before Adam sinned in the garden, we had a perfect relationship with God. But because He fell, we all fell, as it says here in the next part of the verse. That by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. <laughs> you before. Before our sin, there was no death. This is why evolution is completely incompatible with the Word of God. Right. Evolution requires millions or billions of years of death and suffering. Yet we know that before sin entered the world, there was no death of any kind. Mm -hmm. No physical death, no spiritual death. You know, I've even said before, I don't think even a little ant was stepped on accidentally. Right. Well, the whole world worked in perfect harmony without the curse of sin. But by sin came the punishment of death. As we already saw earlier in the book of Romans, for the wages of sin is death. As we'll see later on, the whole of creation was corrupted by sin. And even the trees and the plants and the animals all came under, under the curse of sin. Amen. That's why there is death in this world. Well, I, I still sometimes can't wrap my mind, my mind around how the, these predatory animals and how they didn't have that nature before sin was there. How right. they, we didn't have mosquitoes carrying diseases around. There wasn't 
You know, I don't know what all the purpose was in the perfect creation, but one day that will all be restored again. That's right. But before sin, there was no death. So that's why we, we should not compromise on evolution. It's not compatible with scriptures. As we get farther into this study here, we'll see that if evolution is true, then the gospel can't be true because right. it hinges upon the fact that sin is a result, or excuse me, death is a result of sin. Mm -hmm. But do you have any today that say that, oh yes, it's compatible, that God used evolution, but no, we see in his word that he created Right, a literal world in literal seven days with a literal Adam and Eve that were without sin and then they fell in the garden. <coughs> As it says here, sin has passed upon all and death has passed upon all. And it says next, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Right. Each and every one of us have inherited this sin nature from our father Adam. And thus death is the result of sin. That's right. As far as I've seen in Scripture, only Enoch and Elijah were able to escape death. We know what Enoch was translated, that he was not found. We know that Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. And some, some think that there'll be the two witnesses in Revelation that will come back and will die again. But you can be sure every last one of us to walk this earth except for Christ <laughs> will face death unless he returns in our lifetime. Amen. We can be even more sure every last person that has ever walked this earth, ever will walk this earth aside from Christ has experienced spiritual death. That's right. And that is the more tragic of the two. You're right. We, we think a lot about physical death and certainly there's pain and suffering in that. Certainly we, there's grief and loss to experience in that. And even more so for one that's not saved, but spiritual death is where the real problem lies. That we all die spiritually in Adam. We all, yes, physical death passes upon all of us as well. Spiritual death is passed upon all. Mm -hmm. well, this is why Christ had to be born of a, a virgin and not of the seed of man. But he could come into flesh without the corruption of sin. He could come like as sinful flesh but yet without sin. But he who has been born of the seed of Adam can be sure they have that same sinful nature that Adam had. Amen. Sure there are some people that are more perhaps good in the eyes of men but we're all sinners and ungodly and wicked in the sight of God. Let's try it. Until the Lord saves us. We are all the enemy of God and apart from God without hope in this world. The scripture says that we are transgressors of his law and sinners in his sight. And yet Christ died for us as we saw him previously. Mm -hmm. and I want us to think well, for a moment on a few other thoughts here but so it says here, sin was passed upon all, and death by sin. We know in Romans 3, 23, that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Amen. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this to judgment. So this is not, not some you know, metaphor here. It is sure that death and sin have passed upon all men. Both physically and spiritually, all death and sin have passed upon every last one of us and every one that will be until the Lord returns and until we put on that incorruptible body and put on that immortal body. Till that day, we abide in the body of death. Mm -hmm. And it will die one day until the Lord return and call us home to be with Him. But what is death? I know we, we know physical death is when it expired, but what happens then it's separation of what death really is. Mm -hmm. In the physical sense, the soul is separated from the body. We know in the case of the rich man Lazarus, 
A rich man died, but his, his soul was gone in hell, didn't it? That's right. Lazarus died, and his soul was carried up in Abraham's bosom. And we know, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, that now in the gospel dispensation, as we call it, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if you're saved. Mm -hmm. Because physical death separates the soul and the body, one day we'll be reunited when we put on that glorious body like unto Christ's glorious body. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called to meet them in the air. We, or as it says in Corinthians, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You bet. But in the meantime, we physical death will reign in this world. But spiritual death is what separates us from God. That is why Christ said you must be born again. For everyone since Adam has been has born in this world, spiritually dead and separate from God. Except he makes us alive, except he quickens us, as it says in Ephesians 2, and we will abide in that spiritual death for all eternity. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit is the one who bursts us to do it, if you will, who makes us be born again, as John 3 tells us. And except you have that spiritual rebirth, if you will, you shall spend all eternity separate and apart from God. You're right. But in that new birth, in that new life that he gives us, he gives us spiritual life and he reconciles us to God through the person of Christ and we are now made alive through him. We have life in the person of Christ. But outside of Christ, you're dead spiritually. Mm -hmm. Outside of Christ, you cannot make yourself alive. Any more than David over there in the cemetery can make himself alive, neither can you, except the Holy Spirit. That's it. Grants you life. And that is what it seems that so many miss today. They think they can somehow be saved by their own doing, by their own actions, by their who their father or grandparents were, or who their church they go to, or whatever it may be, these, all these other beings, but except to be born again, you may not see the kingdom of God, Christ said. You're right. And we, of course, we know Nicodemus tried to understand it from a carnal aspect and thought you had to physically be born again and in your mother's womb and come out again, but what you must be born again of the Holy Spirit. He must grant you new life. But until then, you can be sure you under that death that passed upon all men in Adam. That is why Christ said, Marvel not by saying to you, you must be born again. In that. You know, I don't know the Old Testament saints didn't have the gospel in the same sense that we do, but they had looking forward to the gospel. Amen. From all I can tell, they had to be spiritually born again too, because they were dead just as spiritually as we were. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the same sense that we do. That was given to us as a promise of Christ and came upon his people on the day of Pentecost, I believe. And so we are indwelled, now sealed, as it says, by the Holy Spirit. You can be sure no one has ever been saved unless they've been born again of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Unless they've been given a new spiritual life, you're still in your sins and you're still dead to God. You're still separate apart from Him. Except you be brought back into fellowship with him through the person of Christ, you will spend eternity separate and apart from him. You're right. And verses 13 through 17 are all a parenthetical statement here that Paul inserts going even more details about this. So Lord willing, we'll get to that next time. We'll go close with the thought that 
death came by sin, and sin threw Adam, so we all must be born again. Amen.